Okay, now in this lecture, let's talk about the conditional probabilities. And so, now the classic two by two is you really use in many areas. Uh, you can use this in the clinical measures, you can use this in admissions to programs or decisions for hiring. And then um, you also see this in signal detection theory, which, we, which we're gonna talk about. And then number four, you see this in statistical testing. We're not gonna cover in the statistical testing because you, did that already in your, uh, basically in your uh, statistics test, uh, uh, lectures uh, in the previous semester, okay? Now in the clinical measure sense, um, so the classic two, uh, two by two is basically looking at the patient's real conditions versus the instrument, versus the instrument's ruling, okay? So if, if the patient, so you can see that this table is uh, divided into A, B, C, D, okay? So in table A, uh, you have the patient that has the real disorder, and then now the instrument's ruling is that this person is positive for the disorder, okay? So this is something we consider as the true positive. Okay, now, uh, now when you look at D, this is the, this is the easiest one to uh, follow up. So if, the patient does not have the disorder, and the ruling of the instrument says that this person's uh, result is negative, then this is, is, this is a true negative. Okay, now the true negative uh, and true positive is the instrument's correct ruling in which tells that uh, this person does or does not have the disorder. Okay, now you can also have a false positive and you have a false negative. So a false negative is when a person who has a disorder, but the instrument's ruling says that they don't have the disease or they don't have the disorder and vice versa for the false positive, okay? The false positive is when the patient does not have the disorder, but the instrument wrongfully said that uh, this patient has some sort of condition in which that they don't really have. Okay, now when you look at the actual um, aspect of this very example, so let's say if there are n of 200 over here, and in this case, you'll see that the specificity is going to be 0.9, and then, <clears throat> sorry, the sensitivity is going to, is going to be um, 0.9, and the specificity is going, is going to be 0.6. And the positive predictive value is 0.69, and the negative predictive value is 0.86. Okay. Now, what? How do you calculate the? It's um, over here. So the sensitivity is going to be the number of the true positive divided by the number of the true positive plus the number of the false negative. Okay. Now the specificity is uh, something similar to that, but it's the number of the true negative divided by the number of the true negative plus the number of the false positive. Okay, so here you go, you have the sensitivity and specificity. Now the positive, the positive predictive value is going to be uh, the number of the true positive divided by the number of the true positive plus the number of the false positive. Okay, and the negative predictive value is the number of the true negative divided by the number of the true negative plus the number of the false negative. So now you'll see that one of the things, you'll see that the, the example of the population differences, can, they can really have an impact on the sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value. Now, the sensitivity and specificity, that is the ruling of the instrument. So the sensitivity and specificity will not change, okay, when you switch the population. Now, what is going to change when you switch the population? And that would be the positive predictive value as well as the negative predictive value. So I'm gonna give you an example in which we look at the Planned Parenthood versus the high school kids, okay? So let's say uh, in the high school kids, 
you are testing a thousand of them. So this is based on the ruling that the sensitivity is 0.9 and the specificity is 0.95. And then let's say we're looking at a pregnancy test. Okay, so in high school group girls, or out of a thousand kids that are tested, only 20 of them are really pregnant in real life, which makes sense, right? Because not a lot of high school girls are pregnant. Okay, and then you'll see that once you uh, plug in the number of the sensitivity and the specificity, these are the numbers that you get. Okay, so the true positive, true, so so there are 18 that are true positive, there are uh, 300, uh, there are 931 true negatives, you know, and, and so forth. So so the numbers that we are putting in here, okay, so in the, in the plant of parenthood, out of, out of the thousand that are tested, for about 40% of them, so 400 of them are pregnant, are actually pregnant, okay? <clears throat> and when you um, plug in the numbers of the sensitivity and specificity, you will see that the true positive, the number of the true positive and the, and the true negative, blah, blah, blah. So these are the actual numbers, okay? Now, if we were to calculate out their positive predictive value and the negative predictive value, based on the numbers that we actually get that we kind of back solved right then you you actually see that the po the, uh, the positive predictive value for the high school girls versus the positive predictive value for the planned parenthood people they're very different okay just look at the positive positive predictive value in the planned parenthood it's much higher compared to the high school girls Okay. Now, in the negative predictive value, it, there is also some difference, right? So when you look at a 0.997 versus 0.934, that is also a quite dramatic difference. When you kind of think about in terms of percentage, this is 6% differences, okay? So you see that uh, the population of interest based on the demographic or the characteristics of what you're looking at that can really have an effect on the positive predictive value as well as the negative predictive value. All right, so from this demonstration, we can see that while the sensitivity and specificity tell us about the instrument, the positive and negative predictive value tell us about the population, okay? Okay, now next let's talk about uh, admissions. Okay, so let's say if, uh, what would I say hiring decisions? Okay, so now how do you kind of make sure that you are admitting the right person into the school or you are hiring them, you're hiring the right person for their job? And then the same, the same rule apply when you're picking up like a potential maid, ma electing government officials and, and stuff like that. So, so imagine if you have um, a person, let's say if you are the, the admissions dean, or at Harvard University, okay? And then you are trying to admit people who you think will be successful at Harvard, all right? And then, you know, of course you are going to pick the ones that look good on paper, and but, but even the ones that look good on paper, once they get into the Harvard, uh, once they get into Harvard, they struggle and then they don't do so well. Okay, now the ones that uh, are admitted to Harvard but end up flunking every single course, these are the people that are falsely admitted. Okay, so so what that would kind of similar to what? That would be kind of similar to the false positive that we saw in the previous, uh, the, the clinical measurements, okay? Now, let's say if Harvard wrongfully rejected someone, and then this person go go to like a, a school that is almost equally good, let's say Yale University, and ended up as uh, graduating as a valedictorian at Yale. Okay. Well, then you can kind of say that well, Harvard really screwed up in not allowing this person to um, to admit it to be. To be a uh, to be a part of the Harvard graduate class, okay? Because it's obvious that this person would have done really well in Harvard, 
Uh, awesome. So this person that was rejected, wrongly rejected, uh, is was was falsely rejected. So that that's a false rejection. Okay. So that is very similar to a false negative on the on the clinical measurement test. Okay. Of course, you have to write that you have the ones that are correctly admitted into Harvard, and you have the ones that are correctly rejected from Harvard. Okay, so this is are the things that are very similar to uh, to the clinical measurement that we that we're talking about. Okay, now so you will see that there are correct acceptance into the program. There's correct rejection that uh, people that just clearly do not belong to um, this program uh, with, for the, the school. There, but there is also false acceptance and false rejection. And so these are, are very similar to the clinical measure that you saw in the previous several slides. Okay, now let's think about this kind of um, over, okay? Now, what does setting multiple and strict criteria do to your likelihood of accepting the wrong person? Now, so now let's think about it. So if you raise the criteria, and let's say I will only look at uh, students with 4.0 GPA and they need to have perfect score on the SATs and on top of that they need to have at least taken three uh, AP courses in high school and on top of that they must be they must all be president of their uh, high school student body right uh, and then on top of that they must all be valedictorian Okay, so you're thinking, well, this is this is very very strict. Um, this is a very strict criteria. Okay, so what does what does this happen to uh, the acceptance rate? Well, it's going to drop the acceptance rate by a lot, right? So, but that also means you are really ruling out very stringently the people that be does not belong to um, this wonderful university. Okay. So that, that means that your, uh, your false, uh, what, what, what not, that, it, that, that means your false acceptance rate is going to drop like crazy, okay? But that also means that your false rejection rate is going to go up, right? Because, you know, the, the person might not be a valid, valedictorian in their high school, but then might end up very, very close in, in second place. But everything else was also true. But then just got weeded out uh, by Harvard or by whatever school just because of this little blip, you know. So, so that is, uh, so that is going to really also increase the false rejection rate. Okay. Now the vice versa. What uh, if you said something that's very loose? It's like okay, if you have if you graduated at high school. And if you have any kind of GP, uh, if you have if if you have any kind of GED, you know, and our school will take you. Well, then what happened is that yes, you are really uh, you you you're, you're making sure that the people who are are applying, you know, they can get in, and which means that the school is not going to be very selective. So that means that you are decreasing right you are decreasing the likelihood that uh, that, that the person is going to come in and then they are going to do uh, well so, so so what does that mean so that means that you are really increasing the false uh, acceptance rate that's one part that and then so so that's the issue when you when you kind of lose the criteria okay now let's take a look at the next slide okay so now what happens when you raise the the stakes all right so 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 now in what happens to your acceptance rate in general well, it's going to go down right so so the rejection rate is going to go up so that is going to be kind of sort of like a double-edged sword so when you raise the stakes then the false rejection rate is going to go up and then the false acceptance rate is going to go down okay 
Okay, now the next thing uh, let's talk about is signal detection. So uh, now you'll see that uh, on the right bottom here, this corresponds to the handout that I, I gave, that I put in the, uh, in the Blackboard, okay? Now, now, what are some of the problems when you measure the threshold with the data in general? Well, basically, you don't know if the subject threshold is really uh, low or if they're just willing to say yes. So now when you kind of think about the person who's making the decision is now the instrument, okay, in the clinical sense. Or the person who's making the decision is like the dean of the admission school for Harvard School, something like that. Now, now, now so the person who is in uh, that chair, well, in this case, the participants for, uh, participating in the experiment, they have the differences when it comes to their likelihood or their willingness to say yes or to say no. Okay, now, so this difference is that one subject is more willing to say yes than the other, uh, then the other subject means that they have different response criteria. Okay, so the response criteria really is the subjective magnitude of the stimulus above. Uh, which the subject will indicate that the stimulus is, is present. So you're thinking that, wait, wait, what do you mean? Okay, so and anyway, uh, the response criterion is the likelihood a person is going to say yes, there, it is indeed there, or no, it's not in there, you know. So, so this has to do their, with their personality tendencies to, to be conservative or to be liberal. Okay, now how can you tell someone's response criteria? All right, so if someone's response criteria is low, which means that they have a very low threshold, they are very likely to say yes. All right, so you all, we all have friends like that. So whenever you, you ask them for favor, you say yes, 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 yes. And then you're just like, oh my God, they're like the greatest people in the whole world. Okay, well, who doesn't love friends like that? Right, but so, so anyway, uh, these people with the response criteria that is very low, um, well, they tend to say yes, even at the slightest, slightest possibility of detecting a signal. So these subjects are called the liberal subjects, liberal, okay? Now, on the other end, uh, if someone's response criteria is high, they are very likely to say no, okay? So they will only say yes when they're absolutely sure when the signal is present, okay? So these are the conservatives, okay? And they're neutral, they are kind of, uh, the, the neutral are kind of somewhere in between. Okay, so now the signal detection, uh, it's really a two bell curve paradigm that kind of overlaps one another. So basically, it's, uh, we all know that there are environmental signals that are within, that they're all surrounding us. So there are essentially two conditions, All right. So this is where, um, so this is where back to the conditional probabilities uh, with the conditions that's going on. So, so you got one that that has no signal, another one with the signal present. Okay, so the bell curve on the right is going to be the signal plus uh, signal plus noise curve, and then the curve on the left is going to be the uh, noise only signal. Okay, so this is what it basically looks like uh, on this left bell curve. Uh, what you're seeing is the the noise only. Uh, bell curve and the one on uh, the the one on the right starting from here going all the way up here that is your noise plus signal bell curve okay now when there are a lot of overlap between the bell curves that means that the signal is very faint it's very weak okay now when there is a very large separation between the two bell curves that makes the signal is very strong okay or the the environmental noise is very very quiet okay so those are the only two possibilities now the response criterion of someone is going to be either on the left on the right you know now this person is slightly to the left which means that he this person is a slight liberal okay this is this person is slight liberal because you'll see that they are more likely to say yes, okay, and they're less likely to say no. Okay, now again, left bell curve noise, right bell curve noise plus signal, 
Okay, now a liberal person is very likely to say yes. Okay, and you can see that about, you know, well, I think this, I guess maybe around like 80, I was in almost 90%, 90% of the time when they see either the noise only or the noise plus uh, signal, they are very likely to say yes. Okay, and very seldomly they will say no. And over here, uh, you can also have a neutral, which is right split down the 50-50 line. And half the time, they they will say yes, and half the time, they will say no. And on the e other end of the extreme spectrum, then you've got the conservatives, okay? They're very likely to say no, okay? Unless they're absolutely sure that the signal is present, okay? Okay, now this is something that uh, you have seen in, in previous ones. Uh, now, the only term that has changes are the actual vocabulary, the, the, the nomenclature is about it. Okay, so um, now over here you have, uh, up here you have the signal and uh, only over here on the left you got the subject's uh, response. Okay, now when the signal is present and the subject response is present, you got the hit, okay which is essentially the correct acceptance, okay? The, this is called a hit, okay? Now, when the signal is absent and the uh, subject's response is that it's also absent, this is a correct rejection, okay? Now, when the signal is absent, but the subject is, uh, their response is that it's present, well, this is a false alarm, okay? So it's the same as a false positive. And then when the signal is present, but the subject misses it, okay, so that would be a false, that was kind of similar to a, a, a false. So yeah, it's a, it's a false negative, okay, so which means that it's a miss, all right? Okay, so over here, what it looks like, now remember the, the right bell curve is the signal plus noise, right? And this person's criteria is somewhere here. Everything to the right is yes, everything to the no, to the left is no. And you can see that everything that is shaded in the uh, in the yellow, this is a hit. Okay, everything that's sh shaded in the purple, that is a miss. Okay, now let's take a look at exactly the same one, but let's focus on the left bell curve. Okay, now everything on the left of the bell curve is a correct rejection. Everything on the right of this uh, this response criterion, but that belongs to the uh, left bell curve, this is a false alarm, okay? Now, something that we have said before is that if the signal plus noise is very far uh, apart from the noise only bell curve, that means the signal is very, very strong which means that the distance between the peak of the noise and to the peak of the noise plus signal is going to be very far apart if the signal is strong, okay? So this is expressed, so this distance between the two bell curves, the, 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 average, of the, bell, the, the average of the two bell curves, this is known as the D prime. So this is the distance between the noise and the signal plus noise, the mean, the numerical average, okay? So this is indication of two things. This is indication of subject sensitivity, sensitivity level, and another one is this indication of the signal to noise ratio. So the D prime is defined as uh, separation over spread, okay? So separation, what is separation? What is the difference between the means? So uh, what can really affect the separation? Well, the only thing that can really affect the separation is the strength of the signal. If the strength of the signal, uh, the, if the strength of the signal is very, very loud, then there will be a lot of separation in between. Okay, now another one is spread. Okay, now so the spread is the standard deviation of the probability densities. Now, I want to bring out something that you guys probably haven't seen and I probably really hate it in the statistics class, and that is the leptokurtic bell curve versus the platykurtic bell curve. Okay, the leptokurtic bell curve, as you remember, looks like this, okay? 
And the plastic curtain bell curve looks like this, okay? Whereas the normal bell shape curve look more like this. Okay, so plastic curtain has a very high peak and then very narrow spread. So that, that this is why I'm circling here. So the leptocurtic bell curve is less spread and the plastic curtain bell curve is more spread. Okay, now, that, now let's go back to look at the actual D prime for the, what, what the calculation of D prime is. Well, the D prime is separation over spread, so, right? So that would mean that the plastic curtic uh, bell curve that has more spread, what is, what is this gonna do to the D prime? Well, bell, plastic curtic bell curve is going to make this D prime number go down because the spread is in a denominator. And when this goes up, then of course your D prime is gonna go down. And vice versa for the level the, the Because there are less spread, then, uh, then what happened with the D prime level is that it's going to be very big, okay? It's gonna go up. Now let's take a look at some shift in the response criterion, okay? So this person's so let's say in the case that the D prime is one, okay, and this person is a quite a liberal, okay, you can see that the hit rate is about 97.5%, the false alarm rate is 84%, okay? So this person is just so likely to say yes. Okay, now let's, let's say if we were to move the response criterion a little bit more, and now to the point that now the hit rate is only 84% and the false alarm rate has go, gone down dramatically uh, from the previous uh, 80 something to uh, 50 something. Okay, now let's see what happens when you move the response criterion from a liberal to, an, uh, to, a, to a conservative one. So you can see that the hit rate starts to go down, but so does the false alarm rate. Okay, and basically, what you can kind of appreciate when you go through these difference and shift in the uh, response criterion going from liberal to neutral to conservative, what you are going to see is something that if you were to plot out the percentage of the false alarm by the percentage of the hit, you get something called the ROC curve, or, so the, the receiver operating uh, characteristic curve. Okay, so and now so this is something that uh, that gets used a lot, and this is the area under the curve. So this is an indicator how much of the the, the not instrument, but how much of the person that you're looking at, uh, how sensitive it is. So so this is actually another indicator of the D prime. Okay. So now what happens when a person has like a different sensitivity or just their D prime just being a lot different? You'll see that in the left picture, uh, the, when we look at the false alarm versus the hit rate, when we look at the ROC curve, uh, basically you can see that the, this part, okay, let me highlight this. Uh, this part is very close to this left uh, upper, um, Part in which that the, the origin of the false alarm is zero, and then the hit rate is one point zero. Okay, now, so so in this case, uh, the on the picture on the right, and you basically you can kind of see it as uh, the the distance from here to here is very very big. Okay, so that would mean that the sensitivity for this do that here is a lot better than this dude, okay? So just kind of uh, get an idea how the area under the ROC curve can, area under the curve can really give you some indicator of what is the actual D prime level or what is the sensitivity of the person that you are trying to measure. All right, now let's take a look at what else can uh, the D prime be influenced by? Okay, so it can definitely influence by internal noise. So internal noise is really referring to uh, your inner dialect 
uh, dialogue with yourself or uh, when you're thinking about something. So if you were able to really increase your attention, then you can internally block out the noise uh, for you as the perceiver of the stimulus. And then what's going to happen is that uh, increasing the internal noise is actually going to decrease uh, the D prime, which makes sense because the, when the noise it becomes louder and louder, then the signal doesn't change much, right? So when the noise gets louder, then what happens is that um, this is going to make the signal less salient, and then that, that is going to drive your D prime level down. All right, so internal noise is one. And the second one is, is the external noise. And so what happens when your noise, external voice, is, gets higher, then what happened is that this is going to also decrease the D prime. Okay. Now the, the best example that I can give you for the, the external noise is that if you were to listen, uh, let's say at home when when there's like very little people surrounding you and then you're putting the headphone and you're listening to your favorite music, and then usually uh, you can hear it pretty well until you take exactly the same song, exactly the same headphone, and then you go onto the New York City subway, right? Which is a very loud um, place. Um, well, maybe not in the age of COVID nineteen, but uh, but let's say in general, okay. In general, it's it's a very loud place. And now, because of this loud noise, you cannot hear the the music signal that is coming from your headphone, that not that well anymore. Right. So what do you do? Well, what you can do is you need to increase the volume in order to hear it really well. Okay, so that is one method of rebalancing the actual D prime. What's the second way you can do this? You're, you're, I, I think a lot of you can say, well, haha, but I have a noise canceling headphone. Well, that's exactly what you should do if you want to rebalance the D prime level. Um, by reducing the background noise. So the, the noise cancellation uh, headphone does exactly that. It filters out the background noise and then, and which essentially is giving you more separation, but instead it's, it's just that this, your signal is not moving, but now because of the, um, because of the noise cancellation headphone, it's making your left bell shape, uh, bell curve, which is the noise, they, they're, ma they're making that all the way to the left. Okay. Uh, number three, you can increase the signal strength, right? So let's go back to the subway example. You're like, oh my God, this subway is so loud. I can hear my music and you got to crank up the volume. Okay. Which of course I don't recommend you doing because you need to protect your hearing. Okay. But so this is going to, when you increase the strength signal, this is also going to increase the D prime. Okay, now number four, the person's sensitivity. So the sensitivity of hearing something can also really influence the, um, the D prime. Now, but I want to say that the per this person's sensitivity is kind of linked to the internal noise that this person has. So you see that this is basically, uh, these are all the aspects that can really influence your D prime. Okay. Uh, now, I think I'm just gonna cover up to this part uh, on the signal detection. Now, if you're more interested, there's a hang, uh, handout that you can read them. And there's also, a, I, I uploaded a supplemental YouTube uh, lecture by another professor well, not in our school, but another professor. And then, and I thought that uh, this is very explained very well, and it, it kind of covers some of the aspects that I didn't have time to cover here. But uh, the things that I'm talking in this uh, lecture on uh, signal detection is something that's very, very basic. That's something any uh, psychology students should really know. And because this is one of the fundamental aspects of psychological testing, uh, and also when it comes it comes to cognitive uh, neuroscience uh, aspects of that really involves the cognition testing, okay, or psychophysics. All right, so uh, this is really one of the most prominent theories, and then no one can really say that there there hasn't been proven wrong uh, 
but so far. So this is something that's very powerful. And and as psychology student, you should definitely know this, especially when it comes to the experimental psychology aspect. Okay, so that's it for this lecture.